In his right hand, Coach Krull held a banana. <laughs> In his left hand was a condom. Ladies and gentlemen, he said dispassionately, take your marks. Chris flexed his buttocks. Giddy up, he said. Stop being blamed for shit that happens to them at the hands of dumbass men. Okay? <clears throat> shit pisses me off. And welcome back to another episode of <laughs> our book club series. So, um, if you're new here, uh, I do lots of different, or you don't know who I am. I do all types of different content on my channel. Right now, we're doing a book club series um, where basically we read the book together and then we discuss the characters and the drama and the theories about what we think is going to happen. And yeah, if you like book discussions and you like book clubs and that kind of thing, um, then this is definitely probably your thing. You'll probably enjoy this. Um, you can go back and binge watch all of the episodes up until this point. Um, so if you search the hashtag book club series or if you go to my channel and look on my playlists, there's a playlist that says book club the pact you can watch you can watch every episode we've made up until this point so like all the discussions all the drama all the reading everything and just catch yourself back up you can just watch the discussions if you want i mean you don't even have to like it's up to you i like to have background noise so like when i'm getting ready i could totally listen i could totally listen to someone on youtube like in the background while i'm getting ready and like that for some reason that's just like a comfort thing for me I don't know I like it anyways so maybe you want to do that maybe you want to binge watch and just have it on in the background or maybe you just want to go through and watch all the discussion videos so you can just know basically just the drama and what's going to play so hard to say without having to watch every episode the whole way through anyways everybody's different and if you're new here you're more than welcome to jump right in or um start over however you want to do it but welcome i'm so glad that you're here and i hope that if you enjoy my content you'll hang out and stay for a while and i don't know come back maybe let me just go ahead and preface this i feel like i need to preface this okay okay i have ocd so i'm gonna fuck with my hair the whole time okay and um, i'm on the autism spectrum so i'm gonna repeat myself the whole freaking time now if either of those things gets on your nerves, then this ain't the channel for you, okay, honey? Let's get started. Oh, we left off yesterday, because I have no schedule. Listen, I could be like, yo, guys, I'm gonna have, I'm gonna put videos out every Wednesday. I'm gonna put videos out every Thursday. I'm gonna put videos out every Sunday. It's not gonna happen. I can't do schedules. Basically, <laughs> I just kind of show up as much as I can when I can. <laughs> Yesterday, when Melanie, um, uh, no, 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 so Melanie burned all of the evidence that was in Emily's room. Um, she found Emily's diary from before she was dead or whatever. Finds out that Emily's pregnant, um, but finds out that Chris did not know Emily was pregnant. Case, sorry, oh my God, why is it so hard today? The prosecution's case is all based off of Chris wanting to kill Emily um, because he didn't want the baby. So um, Emily's mom, Melanie, finds out in this diary that um, Chris did not know about the baby. So how, why would he kill her when he didn't even know? So anyway, she burns that diary, basically burns all, all of the stuff in Emily's room that has Chris on it because she's just like bitter, I guess. And that's where we ended up. Um, all right, this says in 1997, then in 1997. <laughs> okay, sorry. So this is when they're like younger. This is before Emily's dead. This is when they're in high school. In his right hand, Coach Krull held a banana. <laughs> in his left hand was a condom. Ladies and gentlemen, he said dispassionately, take your marks. There was a general, general wave of ripping as the class groped in twos. Gro sorry, grouped in twos, opened their own individual Trojans. Emily had to use her teeth to get the wrapper open. From the next desk over, a boy watched her bite at the foil. Ouch, he winced. Heather Burns, a friend of Emily's and her partner for this ridiculous health education class, giggled. He's right, she whispered. You're not supposed to use your teeth. 
Emily blushed furiously, thanking God for the millionth time that Heather, and not Chris, was her partner. It was bad enough doing this, but doing it with him would be that much more embarrassing. Health education was mandatory for seniors, so they're seniors. <laughs> Although most of them had been rolling their own condoms down actual penises for several years by the time they entered the class. The fact that high school coaches, like Coach Cruel <coughs> of the swim team, served as teachers made it even less palatable. To a letter, all the coaches were fat and male, pushing 50. Whatever wisdom they could offer to teens regarding sex could only be taken with a grain of salt. In fact, the only saving grace of this class was seeing Coach Cruel stammer over the word menstruation. The coach lifted a whistle to his lips and blew, and there was a flurry of caressing hands as 30 condoms were rolled down 30 bananas. Furrowing her brow, trying very hard not to think of Chris, Emily stroked her hand down the yellow skin of the banana and worked out the wrinkles on the condom. Hey, my banana broke, <laughs> a boy shouted. My banana broke. Someone else snickered. That happened to you a lot, McMurray? Question mark. Emily snapped the condom into place at the base of the banana. Done, she sighed. <laughs> Heather leaped to her feet. We won, she shrieked. Everyone else's eyes turned to them. Coach Cruel ambled down the aisle and stopped in front of their desks. Let's see now. We've got a nice space at the top like we ought to. <laughs> Oh my god, do y'all remember sex education class in high school? Okay, okay. All I remember, let's just discuss this for a second. All I remember was being shown slides of like people with STDs and like what their genitals look like and like like herpes and just like the worst fucking things ever. <laughs> like there was no how do I say this? No safe way to talk about it. It was just abstinence that's it you just don't do it okay that's the only way to avoid disease is you just you just don't do it never you don't talk about it you don't do it and if you do do it you don't really do it you know anyway so i mean that was the most ridiculous most awkward thing like it was just slide after slide of std and disease and like don't have sex don't do it okay sure sure <laughs> I just love that he's like analyzing the way that she put this condom on. I will say we did not get to do this. Like we were not taught how to put condoms on. Okay. That would have been like, you're going straight to hell. Okay. Let's see now. We've got a nice space at the top like we ought to. And the condom isn't bunched, bunched up on one side and it fits snugly at the bottom. Ladies, he said, my congratulations. <laughs> well, McMurray eat, said McMurray eating his banana. Now we know why Heather Heather Burns, her last name's Burns. Lame. Misogynist right there, Mis misogynist. Keep wishing, Joey, Heather said, tossing her hair. Coach Kroll presented Emily and Heather with S-K-O-R candy, candy bars. Emily wondered if that was supposed to be a joke. Score, what is, what is that? Wonder why. Does it look like, oh, score. <laughs> okay, I get it. Like, Emily wondered if that was supposed to be a joke. In real life, Coach Cruel said, putting on a condom isn't a race. <laughs> he grinned, adding, although it probably feels like one. He picked up a banana peel from the floor and looped it into the trash can. If used correctly, correctly, we know it's the best way, barring abstinence, to prevent STDs or AIDS, he said. But 75% of effectiveness isn't a great form of birth control, at least not for those 25 women out of 100 who wind up pregnant. So if that's your method of choice, consider a backup plan. Okay, this is not bad. This is not bad sex education. I mean, at least he's fucking talking about it. Like, shit. Coach Cruel, as Coach Cruel talked, I mean, that is awkward though. But anyways, Heather, Heather, as Coach Cruel talked, Heather unwrapped her candy bar and took a bite. Emily caught her friend's eye and smiled faintly. Ouch, she mouthed. And we're moving on to the next section. With her heart pounding, Emily locked the door to the bathroom and drew the cardboard box out from beneath her skirt. She rubbed at the spots on her stomach where the sharp edges had dug in and then set the box on the sink, sink counter to stare at it. Remove test stick from kit. Make sure you read all directions before beginning test. 
With trembling hands, Emily extracted the foil packet. The test kit was a long, narrow piece of plastic with a squared off swab at the end and two small windows cut out and, oh my god, sorry, and two small windows cut out higher up. Hold swab end of stick in urine stream for 10 seconds, it said. Who could pee for 10 seconds? <laughs> placed, placed, uh, I'm sorry, place test stick in holder and wait for three minutes. You will know the test is working when you see the blue control line appear in the first window. If you see a, a blue line appear in the second window, no matter how faint, you are pregnant. If there is no blue line in the second window, you are not pregnant. And that was like the disclaimer on the pregnancy test. Obvi. But just in case, you know. Emily wiggled down her jeans <clears throat> and sat on the toilet, positioning the stick between her legs. She closed her eyes and tried to go slowly, but counted only to four before her bladder ran dry. Then she, she took the stick, beads of urine still beaded on the plastic, and set it in the provided plastic spoon rest. Three minutes was a very long time. She watched the control line appear in the first window and thought, we were always careful. Then she heard Coach Cruel's voice in her head. 75% effectiveness isn't a great form of birth control, at least not for those 25 women out of 100 who wind up pregnant. The second line came thin as a hairline fracture and carried just as much pain. Emily doubled over, her hand unconsciously curled over her stomach as she stared up at the packaging of the only test she'd ever wanted to fail. <coughs> Next section. The muscles of Chris's back gleamed with exertion, and his shoulders blocked Emily's view of the moon as he reared over her. She raised her hips to him with the uncharitable thought that maybe he could drive the thing out of her, but Chris interpreted this gesture as passion and began to stroke, slow and deep inside her. Her head turned to the side. She could feel him, a battering ram. <laughs> She felt his hand slip between them. He hated it when she didn't come to. And she clamped her legs together before she could remember to relax. Shh, he said. So far in her now. <coughs> Sorry. So far in her now, she could feel an unbearable pleasure. As if this person inside her was pushing Chris out of its space. Suddenly. Huh. Suddenly, Chris convulsed, and, as she always did when he came apart, she laced her arms and legs tight and held him close. He lay heavily, a stone on her heart, squeezing the air from her lungs and almost, with it, her secret. Next section. The Planned Parenthood office was conveniently on a bus line that linked Bainbridge with several less affluent communities to the southeast, to the south and east. The waiting room boasted a mix of ethnicities, some single women and some with partners, some with swollen bellies and some crying into their hands, but no one had the look of Emily herself, a rich girl from a bedroom community where things like this did not happen. Emily, the counselor, a nurse, practi a nurse practitioner named Stephanie Newell, was calling her back inside. <clears throat> Gathering her coat, Emily followed the nurse into a small, homey room. Well. Stephanie said, sitting across from Emily, You are pregnant, approximately six weeks from the look of things. She paused, searching Emily's face. I take it this isn't welcome news. Not exactly, Emily whispered. It had not been real until now. There was always the margin for error with the home pregnancy test, or the possibility that it had all been nothing more than a bad dream. But this stranger, but this, a stranger telling her it was true, was in incontrovertible proof. Have you told the father? Emily noticed in a hazy, detached way that no one was using the word baby. Pregnant? Sure. Father? Yes. But just in case, she assumed, there was no need to put a face to something you might not keep. No, she said tightly. It's your choice, Stephanie said gently. But it's easier to go through something like this, no matter which option, with someone beside you. I won't be telling him, Emily said, her voice firm. 
realizing as the words came that they were true. He's not in the picture. She was not going to tell him? He isn't, Stephanie pressed. He, sorry, he isn't, Stephanie pressed, or you don't want him to be. Emily turned to the nurse. I can't have this baby, she said flatly. I'm going to college next year. Stephanie nodded, non-judgmental. We offer abortion as one option, she said. It costs $325 and you have to pay up front. Emily blanched. She figured there would be a cost, but that was an awful lot. She'd have to ask her parents, or Chris, and that was impossible. She rucked, she rucked at the edge of her shirt up and twisted it between her hands. She had spent her entire life what, being what everyone wanted her to be. The perfect daughter, the budding artist, the best friend, the first love. She had been so busy meeting everyone's expectations, in fact, that it had taken her years to remember exactly why it was all one big farce. It took her years to remember exactly why it was all one big farce. She was not perfect, far from it, and what you saw on the outside was not what you really were getting. Deep down, she was dirty, and this was the kind of thing that happened to girls like her. $325, she repeated. All right, next section. In the end, it was easy. She initially thought of going to Chris and asking him to help her get the money, but he would ask what it was for. And even if she told him it wasn't something she could talk about, he'd figure it out. There were not many things a 17-year-old a 17-year-old would need so much cash for, and quick. So Emily set her clock radio to go off in the middle of the night. She crept downstairs and fumbled in her mother's purse for the checkbook. Ripping off number 688, she made the check out, out to oh my gosh. She made the check out to cash for the total amount, easily forging Melanie's signature her mom. Her mother used her checks only to pay bills, and that was just once a month. By the time Melanie was going crazy, trying to remember what check number 688 had been for, the entire procedure would probably be over. The next day after school, Emily asked Chris to drive her to the bank. She had to cash a check for her mother, she said. The teller, the teller knew her. In Bainbridge, everyone knew everyone, and Emily had gone home $325 richer. The night before Emily was scheduled to have the abortion, she and Chris went to the beach at the edge of the lake. For September, it was a ba it was balmy. <coughs> Excuse me. Maybe I should like come back. I sound terrible, and like it just doesn't sound like it. Just I don't know. I'm insecure about the way that I sound right now because of allergies. Okay, I'm trying to push through it because I know you guys aren't perfect either. But I'm just like insecure. Okay. <clears throat> for September it was balmy Indian summer the night flung across the sky like sheer gauze bringing darkness but no weight Emily could not settle or concentrate her skin felt too small for her body and she was convinced she could feel the thing growing inside her desperate to push it out of her mind she threw herself at Chris kissing him with a fury so that at one point he leaned back and looked at her quizzically what? she demanded. But he shook his head. Nothing, he murmured. You just don't seem like you. Who do I seem like? she asked. Chris smiled. My wildest dream, he said, and buried his hands in her hair. And then, all of a sudden, he had pulled Emily on top of him, her legs falling open on either side of his, of his hips. Sit up, Chris urged, and she did, only to feel him slipping inside her with the change of position. It was too soon. It was too soon. Emily immediately braced her hands on Chris's shoulders, leaning back in an effort to rear away. Oh, that's good, Chris murmured. His head turned to the side. Emily froze and then urged by Chris's palms on her hips, moved tentatively. You look like a, you look like a centaur, <laughs> he said. And surprised, she laughed. That's one thing to say to somebody during the the act. <laughs> what? <laughs> the movement drove Chris even deeper inside her, making the whole thing worse. <laughs> they were joking around just like they used to, 
They might as well have been wrestling as they had when they were children. Practically siblings. But they weren't wrestling. And they weren't siblings. So it was all, so it was all right to have sex, wasn't it? Emily squeezed her eyes shut, scattering her thoughts. That would make you the horse, she said, slightly queasy. Slightly, that would make you the horse, she said, slightly queasy. Chris, Chris, flexed, Chris flexed his buttocks. Giddy up, he said. And bucked beneath, <laughs> bucked beneath her so that the mood rippled over her shoulder, lying light on her breast. Afterward, she lay on her side, her head pillowed by Chris's arm, and his hand resting on her hip, spooning. This was the part she waited to get to. The part where suffering through sex. Suffering through sex? Jeez. She had curled up against Chris a million times in her life. Afterward, it was like it always had been, with nothing embarrassing between them. Sand, he suddenly whispered, is greatly overrated. She smiled faintly. Oh? <laughs> My ass is rubbed raw, he admitted. Emily grinned. Serves you right, she said. Serves me right. I was doing the chivalrous thing, letting you be on top. He splayed his palm over her stomach. Abruptly, Emily sat up, grabbed the nearest piece of clothing, Chris's shirt, and wrapped herself in it to walk along the edge of the lake. Did Chris have a uh, Did Chris have a right to know? Would she be lying if she did not if she did not say anything at all? If she did tell him, they'd get married. The problem was, she wasn't sure she wanted that. She told herself that it wasn't fair to Chris, who thought he'd be getting a girl who'd never been touched by another man. It's not her fault. Like, women need to stop being blamed for shit that happens to them at the hands of dumbass men. Okay? Okay. <clears throat> shit pisses me off. She told herself that that wasn't fair to Chris, who thought he'd be getting a girl who'd never been touched by another man. But a small, nagging throb at the back of her thoughts said that it wasn't fair to her, to her either. If she sometimes went home after making love with Chris and vomited for hours, if she sometimes couldn't bear his hands roaming under her bra and panties because it felt more like incest than excitement, could she really spend her whole life married to him? Emily tossed a pebble into the lake, breaking the smooth surface. It was a strange feeling, knowing that her life would always be intertwined with Chris's. God, it had been since the day she was born, and yet realizing that she was still secretly hoping for an out. Everyone expected Chris and Emily to be together forever, but forever had always seemed a long way off. She pressed her hand to her stomach. Forever had a real timeline now. Emily supposed, then, that the answer was yes. She could marry Chris. This is too high. The alternative would be explaining that she cared about him like a sister, like a friend, not, not necessarily like a wife. And she would see his face whiten, feel his heart crumble in her hands. She did not love Chris enough to marry him, but she loved him too much to tell him that. Emily blinked at the surface of the lake rippling deep and ringed with the sounds of crickets. She imagined how easy it would be to walk into that lake, her, <clears throat> her feet slipping along the silty bottom until the black water covered her, her head and weighted down her lungs, sinking, sinking her like a stone. Until the black water covered her, okay, sorry, I'm gonna read you that shit. She imagined how easy it would be to walk into that lake, her feet slipping along the silty bottom until the black water covered her head and weighted down her lungs, sinking her like a stone. She felt Chris walk up behind her and gently slip his arm around her, sh around her shoulders. What are you thinking about? Drowning, she said softly. Walking in there until it was over my head. Very peaceful. Jesus, Chris said, clearly startled. I don't think it would be peaceful at all. I think you'd start thrashing around and try to get out to the surface. You would, Emily said, because you're a swimmer. 
And you? She turned in his arms and laid her head on his chest. I would just let go, she said. That's where we're going to stop today. So that was reading 16. I don't know if I said that at the beginning of this video. So this was reading 16 uh, of our book club series, The Pact by Jody Picoult. Thank you so much for being here. I love you guys. Again, if you're new here um, and anything that I said resonated with you or you enjoy any of my content at all, I hope you'll come back and hang out. And um, I'm so glad that you were here. I love you guys. See you next time. Bye. How y'all feel out there? I'm light years, call me eons. When the snare kick in, the beat is neon. Lights, yeah, I'm feeling magnificent. Uh, care less what I'm up against.